y'all just going in. Yeah, come on in. <laughs> this greenhouse, um, Jeremy, it's, is it 90 by um, 60? This is like it's about 70 pounds. Yeah, it's probably about a 20 foot. Yeah. No, it's definitely more than 70. I mean, we have about 75 row foot in production. With the other space, it's more. Can some people move down one of those rows? Yeah, we've got another like 15. Yeah, we've got a bunch more people coming in. By the way, folks, you probably have some pocket knives on the way out. Grab that bag of um, cucumbers if you want a munch. Um, I'll give you a, a quick description of what the varieties are. I'm interested in your opinions. Um, and there's also a, a can of Tim's Beets. If anybody's really into munching, they're really spectacular. We always like to provide a little bit of eats for people when they're gonna try taking classes. We don't like low, low blood sugar. It lowers the attention level. Um, okay, we got everybody in here yet? No, keep moving down that row a little bit, Craig. Yeah, I'm smashing on these pretty little bones. Yeah, I'll try not to, but don't worry about it too much. They just didn't listen because we told them to go up and they just didn't do it. <laughs> They went out too. Yeah, aren't they? Okay, you know what? Marshall, are you around? Marshall. Marshall? Calling on Marshall, Marshall. We're not hearing from Marshall. Okay, we'll get him to talk later on about that. Marshall. There he is. Come on up here, Marshall. I got to warn you, I told all the staff that I wanted them to talk, and they all said, Ooh. So, I promise to fill in if he gets tongue tied. But, Marshall, I would like Marshall, folks, um, I'd like Marshall to talk to you about the compost tea program, because I think that's a huge part of why these plants are so big. It's not the only part. Jeremy will talk about our lasagna bed methods, we'll talk about our cover cropping methods. We've been building our soil, but compost tea is huge. And Marshall, why don't you speak briefly to your experience of working with fertilizers and then coming here and switching to the compost tea system. Uh, okay. Uh, I started uh, farming. I was part of the IFAS program at University of Florida. I started farming in North Carolina in 2001. Uh, all conventional agriculture, all plastic, um, using about 800 to 1,200 pounds of 72020 per acre um, pre-plastic and dripping anywhere from three to five gallons of potassium uh, per acre per week. That's how we made the thing work conventionally. Uh, here is a completely different change of pace. Um, I did, had no faith in the compost tea uh, in the beginning and now I have complete faith in it. I mean, we're if you put it on rows, if you tried to do it on a scale, you'd be successful. Someone, someone growing sweet corn, for instance, using compost as an amendment to side dress when you're cultivating, um, using it as an overhead spray, it's, it works wonders. I mean, it, it really livens things up um, and has pushed our production further than I ever expect. I mean, I've, I had no idea that it would be that effective. Uh, but basically, I've watched compost tea do what I've seen conventional fertilizer do time and time again. I've been in the farming business my entire life, uh, uh, from South Florida to west coast of Florida to South Georgia to North Carolina, and it works. It absolutely works. And it has some uh, disease prevention um, when you use a, a high rate per acre. What so. sort of rate are you using? Uh, right now, because our, our entire space uh, is really just a lot of research and development and trying different things, we may total an acre here. 
um, but I use about 80 gallons to the acre, and I use it cut down. I use you know 160 gallons total, um, but I we, we do a very thorough drenching and foliar spray. Uh, one of the most exciting things about compost tea, we haven't really got gotten to do it on a on a large scale here yet, but injecting compost tea into your drip lines using using the right uh, drip system, you can inject tea into your drip lines and, and really put it right where you want it to go weekly and have a weekly foliar spray. I wouldn't be afraid of of any scale. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid of any scale. I, I farmed here about about 120 acres of tomatoes, pepper, uh, cucumber, squash, uh, snap beans, sweet corn, uh, and I've really learned a lot about about other methods. And this, I wouldn't be afraid of it one bit. Do y'all test your compost for nutrient we, levels? We do. Uh, we do. The, the last two tests that we just had come back um, had a CN ratio. We had a 10-6 and we had an 11-2. And Pat will tell you that it's not really going to get any better than that. And the yeah, person that's, that that's about as good as it gets. the person where, that where are you having it tested? Uh, we're having it tested. What out of uh, CDA? All right. We I also use California. Up as well as yeah. Um, um, we, that's part of that class. Is we're going to have both the NCDA and the ANL test okay. the same thing, so people can compare the differences. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the, go ahead. the person that's actually making our compost is is somewhat solely responsible. I mean, he has many different tasks on the farm but he has aced making our compost we that's Juan over there we're going to try and get him to talk about it when we get to the compost site mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I mean I've been amazed by it and I, I would when I say I, I wouldn't be afraid I come from a deal where you put three hundred thousand dollars in the ground before you pick a tomato and I wouldn't be afraid going no dry fertilizer using using tea um, are y'all gonna share your recipe with us? Um, sure, we'll share the recipe and we'll tell you where we got it. Yeah. Yeah. We share everything. We don't have any secrets, you know? We want the information out there. Yeah. We put information out there, information comes to us. That's 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 a sustainable system. And Pat, that's what this whole group is all about too. We're all yeah, agricultural I know. educators. Yeah, and welcome for that. We're totally into it, you know. We love that you wanna to come to us and we wanna make sure we give you as much as we can to take away. So the one thing that um, I'd like Marshall to speak to too is just last week he was going over, you know, we do actually add things to the tea, right? We add fish and seaweed to the tea so that a little bit of fish and seaweed goes much farther if it's got the life, right? Mm -hmm. um, we try to spray in the evening so we get a foliar feed effect, you know? And we try to have one spray go real far, you know? So we add other things to the spray sometimes too, um, including some of the um, organically approved fungicides we use you know, sometimes, sometimes we don't because we want to do a heavy application of tea and those things can be expensive. But we do use fish regularly as a, as a feed with the tea. Um, and last week, Marshall always likes checks in with me with the spray. He usually is right on to what he's going to do. He's got, I don't have to talk to him about it. He's totally taken on the rotations. You know, we do serious rotations for our fungal diseases with the various allowed fungicides, organic fungicides. And Marshall's got that down better than I do. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that, but I, I would say that some of the varieties that we produce here, you know, if you were if you were doing this, your bottom line, you may choose different varieties. A lot of the varieties we use are for flavor and for just researching and trying to see if we can maximize yield and maximize flavor at the same time. Um, Zephyrs are an example of that. Yeah. Right, the Zephyr squash is an example of that. We've been picking the squash for a month, I mean, easily. Um, and the zucchini as well, uh, but you'll see some of the tomato variety. One of the tomato varieties we have is it's just fruiting so hard; it's, it's just very susceptible. We've got a little bit of early blight pressure, um, but we haven't had any serious pressure that would that would cost us a deal. I mean, uh, it, one of the main exciting things about using compost tea is to to incorporate it in conventional farming. You could reduce reduce your fertilizer. You know, if you Someone massive. didn't have their yeah. didn't have the faith in it and said, "Well, instead of using a thousand pounds to the acre, I'm going to use five, six hundred pounds to the acre, and I'm going to start with a compost tea drench uh, early uh, during transplant." You know, so that that would uh, that'd be amazing. See, actually, um, you'd probably have to do 250 pounds, or you'd fry the life in the tea. 
Maybe you, maybe That's you would, the irony. Or you can't use too much fertilizer. Or, yeah. Even fish, if you're using uh -huh. life, you have to back off because the high salt fries the life. So you learn to let the life do it for you to make that little bit of fertilizer go so much further. Uh -huh. you know, because the life is right there. That fertilizer, fertilizer never washes through. The life takes it up. You know, so you don't have to put so much in to keep having to move down. It stays where it belongs. What I wanted to just, and then we gotta get, we gotta move on to other subjects. But um, last week, Marshall's going over the fungicides and all that, and then he said, "What about insecticides?" And I said, "You know, I don't think we have anything to spray insecticides for." And Marshall was just like, "That's crazy," you know. <laughs> and he wasn't like, "That's crazy, you're wrong." He's like, "That's just crazy that you know, in conventional, you spray prophylactically, you just assume you're gonna have bugs, whereas what we assume is." that we have bugs and we have bugs that eat bugs, you know? Yes, Perfect example, right there, that little red bug is a C-Mac ladybug. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a ladybug that has a name that's so long that even the entomologists just call it C-Mac. And it's a huge egg eater, and it's in here tearing up the eggs of everything, including other ladybugs, but basically creating balance, you know? Yeah, it so goes against, completely against what I've, what I've grown up around. And in this area, I've done a lot of work with Mark Lancaster. Uh, who is an extension here for a long time. He's now in chemical sales, so he's not as valuable to me. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I've also had a lot of, uh, done a lot of work with Randy Gardner and Paul Shoemaker, and, and it goes against, completely against what, what I've grown up around, but it's real exciting. And it, it mostly it's works, working. except for invasives, we have excellent control. I'll probably talk about some of the stuff outside because I don't want to cook you. So what I want to do in here now is just Get you to look around, see what's going on. There's the tomatoes right there that we talked about. You can see some are touching the root, right? Those are the sun golds. With our nutrition program, that's why I don't think we'll grow so many next year. They're just fruiting so heavily. You probably know from experience, when plants are at that level of production, it's very hard to keep disease off them because they're putting all their resources into that massive production. Where are we going to market right now? We would be cleaning up because we'd have the earliest sun golds, and you could taste them. You know, you can charge serious money for those, you know. Um, and so then the last thing I want to mention in here before we, I'll encourage people, by the way, as we leave, if you want to try a spectacular bean, go ahead and get yourself one of the Fortex beans. Johnny's calls it the best eating bean there is. Incredibly productive, tender at 10 inches to 11 inches. Um, really spectacular bean. But all I want to speak to in here before we head out is the white stuff you see on plants. And indeed, Marshall, I think you agree we're due to do do this week at week to do a major respray. Yeah, this yeah. is just a clay-based crop protectant and stimulant. It's called Surround. Um, it's something you, you, know, you, you generally use for insect pressure, but also for heat stress. And we had some serious heat stress in here last year, and this year we've been trying to uh, to avoid that. Uh, you don't for use the most part. What is it? No shake law. No. no, we don't use shake law. Has, has, has it helped with it's the curl? Well, no, curl don't probably place the luck. Don't worry about that in the home. home is the, the kale and clay yes. helps with Yes, it has. It helps with all kinds of heat stress. Yeah. Um, the interesting yeah. thing about kale and clay is. No. no, it's not expensive. It's very reasonable. Yeah, very reasonable. Your equipment, you know, it's it's a it's a clay, so you got to clean your sprayer nozzle out some. You know, that's probably the biggest downside, but it's not that hard. Um, the most interesting thing about the kale and clay that I, that I learned is that when it's on the leaf, right, its main function is it makes insects experience what we would experience if we tried to live at the beach, right? Try to eat, sleep, do everything we do at the beach. We'd get pretty tired of it real quick, right? Because the sand would be everywhere and it'd be driving us nuts, and that's what the clay does to the insects. So if you get it on there early, you can really reduce Japanese be Japanese beetle pressure with clay, big time. You know, I can't guarantee. The earlier you get it on, the better, because if they're used to it, it's harder to get rid of them. But if you get it on before they hit, it's it's pretty easy to keep them off quite a bit. Meanwhile, what they discovered for all you down in Alabama, Arkansas, those places that are even hotter than here, they discovered that the the clay you would think would reduce photosynthesis, right? And of course it does to a degree, but because it reflects heat. It actually increases photosynthesis in the long run because it allows the plant to photosynthesize longer. It keeps it cooler. Plants stop photosynthesizing most of our vegetables someplace in the 80s, and this keeps us out, keeps your leaf surface out of the 80s, 80s for longer. So it actually increases production while it's keeping the insects off. Now, <clears throat> education is really useful because the ideal is to sell it to people and not have to get every bit of it off and explain to them that it's a plus that it's on there. 
And we've been successful at doing that when we were at market. And indeed, Rick Goodman managed to do that in the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. He had the, the apples in there and just a description about why it was on the apples. You know, instead of poison, you had this clay. It says on the bag you can you can eat it. I try not to. But, um, you know, but there was a little boy who was here last year. He was eating tons of it, you know. He was fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wasn't eating it by the spoon, but he just wouldn't wash anything. You know? I love what I think of your clinical trials there. <laughs> And, and, and Marshall, what about what about um, if you're if you're teaching another farmer, a commercial mm -hmm. farmer, what about the food safety concern around uh, around compost tea? You know, a is that concern legitimate? And I have to guess your answer there. But b, how do you navigate that concern out in the market world? Yeah, hey, um, you go ahead with it. Uh, the main thing I could say is the 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 compost is not harmful when it when it's in a finished stage. When it's in a finished stage, there are no pathogens, there are no, there's nothing. But I'm going to take a vote. Should we go outside to talk about sure. this? Yeah. 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 Can I have a question? Can we, can we do it outside? Yeah, we'll talk about